at the uh, first point, introduction, bullet point number one in the previous lesson we studied, how the Niagara Bible Conference declined due to lack of leadership and doctrinal division. We saw how American millenarianism was divided over the timing of the rapture. So we saw how there was a, a rift within the Niagara Bible Conference. You had two things going on. Number one, you had the death of two of the biggest leaders uh, within three, four years of each other with Brooks and, um, and Gordon. And then within 10 years, virtually almost all of the rest of the men that were instrumental in founding of that died within 10 years of each other. And the second reason that led to the decline of the Niagara Bible Conference was the division over the issue of the timing of the rapture, which we talked about last time. So, in this lesson we want to consider what happened to American millenarianism after 1901 and the leaders... Uh, Arno C. Gabeline and C.I. Schofield, who became the great champions for dispensational premillennialism in the United States. So the first point I want to talk to you about is the post-Niagara landscape. All right? The any moment coming controversy was evident in the pages of Our Hope as early as 1898, when W.J. Airdman, writing about St. Paul at Thessalonica, took a strong post-tribulation position. This is what he said. It is therefore conclusive that Paul neither taught an immediate coming of the Lord, either for or with his saints, nor that he changed his mind. Now, it's important that you understand a couple things. First of all, the, the, the journal Our Hope was started by Gabeline. Okay? So as early as 1890, uh, let's see, what's it, 1898, there is already beginning to show up in print now. The, the, this division oh, between the pre-tribulationists and the post-tribulationists over the timing of the rapture. Erdman is going to be, a, he's, he's a post-tribulationist, he changes his mind at some point, all right? Point number two, Gabeline, who established our hope in 1894, was quick to respond. He challenged Erdman's position, but his gentle and considerate style reflected his respect for Erdman, and his willingness to discuss the issue as a matter of legitimate investigation. By late 1900, however, Gabeline's style and tone took an abrupt change. In a special December issue of Our Hope, he de uh, devoted to Christ's premillennial advent, Gabeline included articles written by Schofield and Erdman and reprinted something from Truth by James H. Brooks. Schofield's article entitled, May the Lord Come at Any Time, was strongly pre-tribulationalist. Although his article did not touch on the controversy, Erdman was never invited to write for our hope again. So, the, the seeds, this, this, this argument, this controversy is now showing up in print, okay? And it shows up first on the pages of Our Hope. Our Hope is a periodical, Bible study periodical, as I said, started by Game Line in 1894, okay? 1898 now, 1900, things are starting to change. At first, Gabe Line is very sort of uh, respectful, um, sort of allows Erdman to share his views, what have you, but there comes a point where he's had enough and he's not going to allow him to write any more, uh, any more uh, guest articles for our whole periodical, and that happens late in the year 1900. In February now, 1901, the next point, Gabe Line made his point bluntly, and this is what he said. No one can continue to give out a true scriptural edifying testimony of the coming of the Lord who believes that certain events must come to pass before the Lord comes, or that the church will pass through the tribulation. Gabeline had in effect excommunicated the post-tribulationalists and had begun to treat them as defectors from the grand old party. So, early 1901, February now 1901, in, in, in our hope, Gabeline is going to come out strong and he's basically going to say that anybody that denies uh, the pre-trib position is not giving clear, consistent testimony of the coming of the Lord and the events surrounding it. So he's coming out, he's, he's really sort of drawing a line in the sand here in, in the publication in February 1901. And he's saying that anybody that's teaching that the church will pass through all or part of the tribulation is not giving a true testimony a true spiritual witness to the uh, nature of the Lord's coming. And so he comes out in print, and uh, if you remember back to last, last week, this is roughly the time where there began to be a hard break in division between these guys, 
where they realized that they could no longer cooperate with each other early in 1901. So the controversy apparently involved more than theology for both Cameron and Gabeline. Now, just to remind you that Cameron was the guy who, in his publication, we saw last week, was coming out strong in favor of the post-trib position. So the controversy apparently involved more than theology for both Cameron and Gabeline were running periodicals which claimed to be an apostolic succession from Brooks and Gordon. All right? So, I know these points on the board here are kind of random, but I'm putting them up here somewhat for my own remembrance, but some for yourself. Um, so Brooks and Gordon die, if my memory serves me correctly, Gordon dies in 1894, and Brooks dies in 1897, okay? So what starts to happen is a paper war between Gabeline and Cameron over whose periodical is the rightful successor of these two men's ministries, okay? Gabeline is with our hope. And Cameron is with, and I can't remember the name of it here. Um, where's it at? We'll come to it, and then I'll write it on the board because I know what's in here. So back to the last point on page one. The controversy apparently involved more than theology for Cameron and Brooks. We're running periodicals which claimed to be an apostolic succession from Brooks and Gordon. Cameron had stepped into Gordon's editorial position in 1895, was scarcely a break in cadence. So it's interesting. When Gordon dies, Cameron assumes editorial responsibility of Gordon's paper. Alright? Now, Cameron is not necessarily in 100% agreement with what Gordon was teaching. But when Gordon dies in 1894, in 1895, Cameron is going to assume editorial responsibility of Gordon's periodical. So I'll continue with that point. <coughs> Cameron had negotiated with him about merging their two papers. That's too far, skipping too far ahead. Sorry, Cameron had stepped into Gordon's editorial position in 1895 with scarcely a break in cadence. During the last years of Brooks's life, Cameron had negotiated with him about merging their two papers. Nothing came of that, but when Brooks died, Cameron bought the magazine from the publisher, Fleming J. Revel. So, when... So, I'm trying to be clear with you. When Gordon dies, Cameron assumes editorial responsibility of Gordon's paper. Before Brooks dies, Cameron negotiates with Brooks to merge the papers together into one. It didn't happen. Okay? But after Brooks dies, Cameron purchases the rights to Brooks's paper from the publishing house Rebel. Is everybody following that? Okay? Truth is the name of the paper. Yes, thank you. Cameron had negotiated with him about merging, uh, blah, 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 that's where he got that. Nothing came out of it, but when Brooks died, Cameron bought the magazine from the publisher, Fleming J. Rebel. Cameron could not have possibly carried out the editorial policies of both men in the, in the same paper, since Gordon had been a historicist and Brooks a Darbyite dispensationalist. It is true, however, that both men had looked for the immediate advent of Christ. Just quickly, a historicist is somebody that believes that we are currently living within the fulfillment of the book of Revelation. Okay? So they will believe that we are some, most historicists believe that we are somewhere between Revelation 16 and Revelation 19 within the fulfillment of the book of Revelation. So the vast majority of Revelation has already been fulfilled in church history. Therefore, they call them the, the title historicist. Because they view the majority of the book of Revelation as already having been fulfilled. The opposing view to that is futurism. Which says that Revelation is either in, is that the majority of Revelation is awaits a future fulfillment, or the entire book of Revelation awaits a future fulfillment. So the historicists believe that we are living within some time between sixteen and chapter sixteen and chapter nineteen of the book of Revelation. It's the easiest way I can explain it. If you want to know more about that, 
There are two lessons where I taught on it for two hours, the differences between them, uh, back in other lessons <coughs> that are available on the website. So meanwhile, Gabe Wine chose to ignore Cameron's legal claims as the successor of Brooks's paper and represented his paper, Our Hope, as the true successor uh, to the beliefs of Brooks and Gordon. According to Krause, with Schofield's help, Gabe Wine secured the mailing lists of the truth and advertised his magazine, Our Hope, as the doctrinal successor to it. He justified this by claiming that Cameron was not faithfully carrying on the prophetic witness of Brooks and Gordon. So, Cameron technically owns the legal rights to Brooks's paper. Okay? But Gabeline says that Cameron is not faithfully continuing the testimony that these men had while they were still alive. So therefore, Gabelot ignores whatever legal claims that Cameron has in terms of ownership to the paper and paints his paper, Our Hope, as the doctrinal successor to the ministry of these two men. Does everybody follow that? Okay. Now, I hope we make sure I didn't miss anything here. Schofield comes into play because Schofield allegedly helps Gabelot secure the mailing list from Brooks's paper. Now you say, well, why would that be the case? Well, we'll see in a little while that when Schofield gets saved, he's mentored by Brooks. So Schofield has a personal relationship with Brooks and with Brooks's family, okay? Because of the nature of his conversion to Christ and the fact that Schofield was directly mentored to Brooks. So these two men are arguing over who is the rightful successor to the ministries of these two men. Cameron has a legal claim. Gabe Wine is saying that it doesn't matter what the legal claim is. We are in line with these men in terms of the doctrine and the teaching. And Schofield allegedly helped secure the mailing list from Brooks's magazine uh, for Gabe Wine for our hope. Everybody with this? <coughs> so, in May of 1902, Cameron began an eight-page, uh, eight-part, sorry, series entitled to the friends of prophetic truth, which so antagonized and alienated the pre-tribulationists that the breach was never healed. Cameron proceeded to explain how he had first he had come first to accept and then later reject the doctrine of the secret rapture. Among other things, Cameron tried to claim that Gordon and Brooks had modified their views on the second coming at the end of their lives. Lastly, Cameron turned historian and claimed that the pre-tribulation rapture originated during a tongues meeting at Edward Irving's church. You guys that have been with the class, do you remember that? We've, we've gone over that and thoroughly debunked that. So, it's interesting though that in, the, in our day, Dave McPherson is not the first guy to make that charge. Cameron actually made it at the turn of the last century. So, according to Cameron, the pre-tribulationists were accepting a doctrine first taught by a heretic, supported by lying spirits. So the idea that the pre-tribulation rapture originated in a tongues meeting in Edward Irving's church was not first put forth by uh, Dave McPherson starting in the 1970s. The argument was first made by Cameron way back in the early 1900s. Now, again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over all that ground again. But if you want to know about that... Go to the church, go to the uh, website and watch the lessons. There's three lessons on called Darby on Trial, debunking attacks against the pre-trib rapture. Okay? So he's saying what Cameron is doing is he's saying that it's of new origin and that the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture first was taught by a tongue-speaking person in Edward Irving's church. And this is what he said. In Watchword and the Truth. Do you uh, do you, do you think it wise to exalt into a test of fellowship a doctrine so recklessly enunciated that does not have a single passage of Scripture beyond the question of a doubt upon which to rest its feet, that has such a questionable origin from the lips of a heretic and supported, and supported by the testimony of demons, and that was enforced by, uh, by him and by them, then as it may be now, as the only means by which a sleeping church could be aroused to activity. So he is, listen, is he blasting these guys? Yeah. Wow. He's, he's going after them and he's using the same argument that we already discussed. Again, the argument that the pre-tribulation rapture was first taught in Edward Irving Church in 1830 uh, in, in a tongues meeting. And therefore the entire 
pre-tribulation rapture idea is of satanic, demonic origin because it originated in a tongues meeting in 1870. Now, again, we've gone over that, spent three or four hours in this class going over why that's not true. Okay? And, again, I don't want to digress too far into things that we've already spent four hours on or we'll never get anywhere, but... The bottom line here is this. This rift is this becoming so severe that it's not ever going to be able to be fixed. Yeah. Okay. He is now charging Gabe Line. Whatever, you know, listen, I'm not saying that Gabe Line and Schofield are above reproach here, okay? Because, you know, he is willfully disregarding his legal claim in what he's doing, okay? So you can, you know, that's not necessarily the best thing to do either, obviously. But the bottom line is, doctrinally speaking, are these two ever going to be able to come back together after this? Probably not. Not unless one is willing to totally, you know, admit that they were wrong and that the other one was right, which, as you know, very rarely ever happens. So, the result of this paper war between our hope and watchword and truth is that... The Gabeline Schofield party emerged from the struggle far stronger than their opposition. According to Sandy, this can be explained partly by the superior organizational and editorial skills of the pre tribulationists and would be attributed in large part by the pre tribulationists themselves and their better grasp of Scripture and the consequent blessing of God upon their party. So, Who's going to emerge here? And if you're going to assign a winner and a loser to this argument, who wins? Gabe Line and Schofield emerge from this as the stronger group. So the, the, pre, the pre-tribulationalist wing of premillennialism in the United States is going to emerge from this struggle as the stronger of the two groups. And they're going to remain that way for quite a while, moving on into the 20th century. Okay? So it's important that you understand that, that the, the combination then of, of, of Gabe Line and Schofield are going to be the ones that are going to drive this thing forward after the, after the Niagara Bible Conference fell apart. <coughs> now, Gabe Line provided the spark for the millenarian movement during the first two decades of the, 20, of the 20th century. Rather than withdrawing to lick his wounds, he led his followers in a vigorous campaign of expansion. In 1901, he rented Park Street Church in Boston. He goes right in. What Gabe Lyon does is he, he rents a church in the hometown and base of Cameron's ministry and holds a series of meetings where they teach the pre tribulation rapture right under Cameron's nose. That, I mean, so Gabe Lyon is. When I say when it says there in the notes that he goes on the offensive, not only does he go on the offensive as far as what he's teaching, but he goes right into the Cameron's home turf to do it. So Gabe Line is sort of, uh, you know, he's he's not afraid of um, doing what he feels needs to be done. In 1901, he rented the Park Street Church in Boston, Cameron uh, country, and held a three-day conference for his supporters. A similar conference was held in May in New York City. In 1901, Gabe Line and Schofield, with the financial support of some wealthy Plymouth brethren, began the Seacliff Bible Conference on Long Island, which continued for ten years. Gabe Line heralded the Seacliff, uh, sorry, heralded Seacliff as the rightful successor of Niagara. It was this group that planned the prophecy conferences at Chicago in 1914 and in New York in 1918. C.I. Schofield spoke at many of these conferences, as well as a roster of other speakers uh, who appeared quite regularly. James M. Gray, uh, Henry M. Parsons, F.C. Jennings, John James, and George L. Ulrich. The dispensationalists had won the day so completely that for the next 50 years, friend and foe alike largely identified dispensationalism with premillennialism. So these guys, under the leadership of these two men, the pre-tribulation, the pre-trib faction of premillennialism in the United States, 
is going to basically become so synonymous with pre-tribulationalism in this country that it becomes virtually common knowledge that if you are a pre-tribulationalist, I'm sorry, if you are a pre-millennial, you are also dispensational. Now, are there any questions about any of that before we move on? <clears throat> Mike? Well, I, I would just say that Our Hope magazine was a very popular magazine if you were living at that time. Yeah. It was much like the Breed Searchlight was under Stan. Just a little <laughs> booklet that came to your home every month, and uh, but it was subscription driven, but um, it was very pop popular yeah. magazine. And, and like I said before, it had a long run too, into the late 50s. Yeah. And, and part of that is, because, at least allegedly, is because Schofield helped secure that. That mailing list from from Brooks's uh, magazine, but these two guys then are going to are, are going to lead in the first two decades of the 20th century. These two guys are going to lead the premillennial charge, and dispensationalism is going to become synonymous with premillennialism in the United States. Now, as you know, and as we'll see over the next few weeks, eventually Schofield publishes what his reference Bible. When he publishes his reference Bible, and this doctrine and teaching gets written into the notes of the reference Bible, and the reference Bible sells into the millions of copies, you can see how this thing is going to how this thing is going to uh, unfold here, um, and how the influence of, of a dispensational approach is going to become popular in the United States. Now, when I say popular, I mean amongst people like you and I. The academic world and the denominational world never liked the Schofield Reference Bible, and we'll talk more about that later on. So, it was at the Seacliff Conference, though, in 1901, that Schofield first discussed with Gabeline an idea that had been growing in his mind for some time, an annotated version of the Bible. Now, this is Gabeline's testimony from his book, The History of the Schofield Reference Bible. He says, one night, about the middle of the week, Dr. Schofield suggested after the evening service that we take a stroll along the shore. It was a beautiful night. Our, our walk along the <coughs> shore of the Sound lasted until midnight. For the first time, he mentioned the plan of producing a reference Bible and outlined the method he had in mind. He said he had thought of it for many years and had spoken to others about it, but had not received much encouragement. The scheme came to him in his early days of his ministry in Dallas, and later, during the balmy days of the Niagara Conferences, he had submitted his desire to a number of brethren who all approved of it, but nothing came of it. He expressed the hope that the, that the new beginning and this new testimony in Seacliff might open the way to bring about the publication of such a Bible with references and copious footnotes. So it's the, it's the testimony of Gabe Lyon that at the 1901 Seacliff Conference that Schofield has this conversation with him where he first mentions to him his desire to put out an annotated study Bible and, Schofield, and, and Gabe Lyon is going to support the idea. The Bible which Schofield discussed with Gabe Lyon that night is perhaps the most influential single publication in the millenarian and fundamentalist historiography. The Schofield Reference Bible com combined an attractive format of ty uh, ty typography, paragraphing, notes, and cross-references with the theology of Darbyite dispensationalism. This Schofield Reference Bible, and we're, this is going to be the main focus of our discussion next week and, and, and for a few weeks, this is by far the single, the single most influential document Public, published document that comes out of this era in American church history as far as premillennialism, dispensationalism, and fundamentalism are concerned. Okay? The, the, the impact of it should not be underestimated, and it's hard to overstate the impact that the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible has upon American uh, uh, premillennialism and fundamentalism. In 1902, the men who were backing the Seacliff Conference decided <coughs> to make the finances available for the publication of the reference Bible. So the decision to, to move forward is made roughly in 1902. 
Now, there are other things that are going to have to be worked out as time moves forward, like who's going to publish it and, uh, you know, other, other things that would go, that you would uh, sort of assume would be involved in putting out something as, as, as big a project as this would be. But the fundamental decision to move forward with it is made in 1902. It is published and released by Oxford University Press in New York City in 1909. So the decision is made to move forward in 1902. The Bible, the first edition of the Bible is going to be put out in 1909. Now, before we start talking about who Schofield was himself, does anybody have any questions about any of that? Is the Bible still being printed and made today, or did they stop doing that? No, it's all my I, I believe it's, it's still, still being printed. Because my Bible's dated back like 10 years it was printed ago. So. You mean the last time the copyright was renewed? Uh, well, it yeah. says that this was printed in such, in such year. Yeah. Mine says that it was uh, printed under the 1996 copyright renewal. Okay. Um, I'm assuming most, if anybody has one in here, that's probably the case, unless you have an older one. Um, so the, the, the publication, it, again, the, the decision to, to produce it is made in roughly 1902. It's printed, the first edition is printed in 1909. Now, are there any other questions regarding that chronology before we start talking about Schofield himself? Now, before we go any further, a book that is as influential as the Schofield Reference Bible was, should you expect that everybody is just going to accept it? No. 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 So, both the Reference Bible itself and its primary editor, C.I. Schofield, have been the target of attacks by people who don't like dispensational theology. Okay? Now... In 2009, so at the 100, commemorating the 100 year anniversary of the publication of the Reference Bible, uh, Todd R. Mangum and Mark S. Sweetum put out this book, The Schofield Reference Bible, Its History and Impact on the Evangelical Church. So what they do in this book is they go through and discuss Schofield, the roots of the theology in the Schofield Reference Bible, the dispensational scheme presented by Schofield in the Reference Bible, and then the impact of the Reference Bible both in Great Britain and here in the United States, as well as the legacy of the, of the, the Reference Bible. <coughs> in my estimation, having read at least four books about this in addition to this one, if I were going to recommend you read one book about Schofield and the Reference Bible, I think this one is the most fair-minded myself. Okay? Um, and I'll, I'll just explain a little bit about that here as we go through this. In 2009, in commemoration of the 100-year anniversary of the Schofield Reference Bible, R. Todd Mangum and Mark Sweetum wrote the Schofield Bible, Its History and Impact on the Evangelical Church. According to Mangum and Sweetum, evaluating Schofield's life story presents a fascinating plot line, complete with mystery, twists and turns, shameful failures, and glorious triumphs. His life presents both bursts of radiant, uh, regenerative light and shadows that conceal the whole story to this day. All right. Now, it's important that you understand. Does everybody know what the word historiography means? Historiography is the study of the history that's been written. It's kind of a little bit of an obscure concept. But it's basically, well, I'll just explain it by reading this point. Early biographies of Schofield kept the controversial portions of his life off the record. So if you read an early biography, they're not going to talk to you about anything that Schofield might have done that would have been controversial. They just leave it out. Okay? Whether by design or by intended consequence, an, in, uh, an image with the Christian public was established that suggested that the one responsible for the notes of the Schofield Reference Bible was in a class of saintliness approaching that of the Bible's main subject. Okay? So there is a, they do not include anything about Schofield in these early biographies that may be 
that may be um, damaging to Schofield and by connection they're damaging to the, to the reference body. So, a few of these are <coughs> the life story of C.I. Schofield by Trumbull, that was, that was 1920. The History of the Schofield Reference Bible by Arnold Gabe Light in 1943. The Story of the Schofield Reference Bible by his son Frank Gabe Light in 1959. And then a series of uh, um, public, uh, published things in the Sunday School Times. What I Learned from Dr. Schofield by Lewis Ferry Schaefer. All right. Now, in the mid-1980s, a Schofield detractor named Joseph Canfield self-published a study of Schofield's life, the incredible Schofield in his book, with the goal of unearthing secrets and bringing the dirt to the surface. Notable for the extensiveness of its research, its approach is like that of a private investigator charged with collecting evidence against a felon. No rumor is deemed unworthy for consideration as potential fact, and no motive of Schofield's heart deemed, in, deemed incapable of being impunged. So in the mid-1980s, Canfield's going to write a book that is going to seek to excoriate Schofield. Okay? <clears throat> so we have a problem here when it comes to Schofield. Does anybody care to guess what it is? The problem... Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, he had a little drinking problem before he was saved, and he's divorced. Yeah, those are, those are two of the... <laughs> Two of the, what are going to be two of the big issues? Plus he was in prison. <laughs> yeah. But my point is this. When it comes to the written literature about Schofield, in my opinion, largely until this book is published in 2009, you either have the friends of Schofield writing about him and not telling you anything about what he may have done that would have been um, not good, you know what I'm saying? And then you have this other guy who hates Schofield, who does not like dispensational theology, writing a book seeking to just go into any little, any little nook, cranny, and facet of his life and pull out anything that he can use to discredit him. All right. So there was not a very the, the historiography of the of the works that were out there on Schofield were not very, you know, they, they were very polarized. You had his friends on one hand, you had his enemy on the other hand, and there was nothing sort of in the middle that acknowledged, yeah, Schofield did some things that he shouldn't have done, but didn't necessarily try, seek to disparage everything that he did after he got saved. So, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about this stuff here. Um, so, point number two on page four. The result of all this is that the facts of Schofield's life have today become politicized, particularly among those in opposition to Schofield's theological views. Rumors continue to swirl, especially via the internet, about infidelities, crimes, and misdemeanors in which Schofield is alleged to have fallen into. Others have objected to this largely post-humorous defamation of his character and have sought to restore his image and spirit. The work of Mangum and Sweetum, that's this one right here, attempts to present a fair-minded evaluation of Schofield's life and ministry that does not defame, or sorry, that does not defend or defame his life and ministry. Schofield was born August 19, 1843, in Leeuwenau County, Michigan, interestingly enough, the youngest of seven children. After his mother died, unable to recover from his birth, his father remarried, resulting in Schofield being raised by his stepmother. Little is known about his early life and education. Schofield reappears in the historical record in 1860 in Lebanon, Tennessee, in the home of his sister, uh, Laura, and her husband. He enlisted in the Confederate Army on May 20, 1861, still being a minor. He falsified his enlistment papers by claiming he had been 20 years of age. He fought for the Confederacy on the Eastern Front at Richmond until he requested a release in 1862. He claimed to be an alien, having resided in Michigan, and to have falsified his enlistment qualifications. All right, so, mark number one against Schofield, he is a known one. Liar. He lied to get into the Confederate Army. And then he lied, in a sense, to get out of the Confederate Army. Okay?
Okay? So anybody seeking to, to, to dis disparage and discredit Schofield is going to point to this as a character flaw and say, he was a liar once and he's always what? Liar. He's always been a liar. Okay? <coughs> Schofield next appears in the record in St. Louis in 1865. Another sister, and I'm going to say this, Emmeline, is mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. Emmeline had married Sylvester uh, Papin a, of a French family prominent in the world's fur market. Papin was president of the St. Louis Board of Assessors. Schofield found employment in his brother-in-law's work and in, in advancing among the city's social elite met, uh, how do you say this, Lonatine? Laurentine, Laurentine, Uh They married on September 21st, 1866. Sometime after, sometime after this, Schofield moved his family to Atchison, Kansas, where he entered a career in politics and was elected in 1871 as a representative to the lower house of the Kansas legislature. In 1873, he was appointed by President Grant to the office of district attorney for the District of Kansas. <coughs> he resigned within six months under suspicion of misuse of his office for personal gain. His wife gained a legal separation from her husband in 1877. The, the marriage dissolved, uh, though the divorce did not become legal for seven more years, which would have been 1883. After separating from his wife in 1871, Schofield returned to St. Louis, leaving his wife and children behind and appears to have sunk into a life of thievery and drunkenness. So, Schofield, is, the nature of the political improprieties is not clear, okay? Most of the, most people suspect some type of graft or bribery that he was involved in for personal gain while he was in, while he was a political official <coughs> in the state of Kansas. After that, He's forced, he, he leaves, he goes back to St. Louis, and he leaves his wife, his wife and his children in Kansas, all right? And he's separated from them. He is later officially divorced from his wife after about seven years in 1883, okay? Um, he appears to have been arrested and some other things. Top of page five. In 1879, perhaps attending a crusade led by D.L. Moody, Schofield trusted that Jesus Christ died for his sins. So this is, Schofield's conversion is after the mess that happened in Kansas, and he is now living estranged from his wife in St. Louis in 1879. In 1879, perhaps attending a crusade, I already read that, uh, he trusted Christ. Schofield claimed that he never touched a drop of alcohol after that day. There's much evidence to suggest that he was indeed a changed man. However, he never reconciled with his wife or his children. Um, his wife and children were apparently assisted by well-to-do family members, but as far as Schofield's Christian testimony was concerned, they remained to his dying day a skeleton in his closet. Upon his conversion, Schofield determined to use his analytical and oratory skills for Christian service. Soon, Dr. James Hall Brooks, pastor of the Washington and Compton Avenue Presbyterian Church, and St. Louis, Missouri was personally discipling Schofield in Brooks' own home. So there's the connection here <coughs> between, between Schofield and Brooks. When Schofield gets saved, later in life, he is immediately begins to be mentored by Brooks. Brooks, as you recall, or maybe if you didn't know, Brooks was a dispensationalist who had John Nelson Darby in his church teach from his pulpit and his podium when Darby visited the United States. Okay? So there's a direct connection. Uh, Schofield is connected directly to Darby through Brooks. Darby knew Brooks. Brooks mentors Schofield after Schofield gets saved. <coughs> Any questions about any of this so far? Schofield proved himself to be capable and eager to join the work of Christian service, willing to carry signs or hand out pamphlets, and also adapted public speaking, he became a key leader and popular preacher in the local YMCA. It was, it was not long until his leadership and preaching gifts were sought after for pastoral service. 
He was licensed to preach by the St. Louis Administration of Congregational Churches in 1880. With the organization, he planted a church, Hyde Park Congregational Church of North St. Louis, and became the founding pastor. The Council of Congregational Ministers and Churches, which was the body officially charged with determining Schofield's fitness for ministry, deemed all the past events of his life covered by the blood of Christ and officially ordained him for pastoral ministry. So when, when Schofield appears before this board of people that are going to ordain him, According to my knowledge, from what I can gather, he lays out to them, you know, the whole rotten story of everything that he's done, and the ministry, the board of uh, the, or the ordination board says, well, those things happened before you were saved. You are now saved. You've you know turned the corner and so on. You're not drinking anymore. Blah blah blah. We're going to ordain you for the ministry. It is apparently how it went. <coughs> so. In 1882, Schofield accepted a call to a mission church of the denomination in Dallas, where he was ordained in 1883. A small work grew rapidly. Within the decade, the church reached a membership of over 400 <coughs> from the 14 when he first arrived. A large church was erected in 1889. In 1884, he married a member of his congregation, Hetty Van Wark. And in 1887, he began to appear regularly in the Bible Conference in the Bible conferences, such as Northfield and Niagara conferences, recognizing, recognized for his teaching abilities. In 1888, he published an immensely popular, rightly dividing the word of truth, an explanation, an explanation of dispensational, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial approach to interpreting Scripture. In addition, around this time, Schofield began publishing a Bible correspondence course that enrolled over 10,000 people. In 1914, these courses became part of the curriculum offered by Moody Bible Institute. Moreover, the notes from these courses also served as the basis for the notes in the Schofield Reference Bible. <coughs> so, all this stuff about his lying for entrance into the Confederate Army, his lying for being, you know, uh, discharged, his uh, political chicanery, whatever that was in Kansas his uh, estrangement and later divorce from his wife. All of these things in the early biographies of Schofield are totally ignored. Okay? Then, Scanf then Canfield comes along in the eight middle of the 1980s and writes his book, bringing all this stuff to the surface and trying to discredit everything that Schofield ever did and cast doubt and disparagement upon the Schofield Reference Bible and create the perception or at least create doubt in people's minds whether or not Schofield was really even qualified for the ministry and whether or not he should be doing any of these things uh, that, that he later did, including all the things that we just read. The, the pastorates that he served under, the, the, the articles that he's writing, the, the correspondence study courses, the fact that those are later uh, you know, included in the curriculum at Moody Bible Institute, um, you know, all these things are now, you know, Canfield's purpose is to create doubt in everybody's mind about Schofield. So, it's important, I think, that we at least acknowledge that Schofield had these things in his, in his past, if we're going to be honest about it. <coughs> now, one note, it is interesting to me, personally, that the Schofield notes got included in the curriculum at Moody Bible Institute. Because if you look at where Moody Bible Institute's at now, compared to where they were, that they would have accepted those notes into the curriculum, it's pretty, it's pretty frightening about how fast the decline was. And the reason for that, in my opinion, one of the reasons for that, that happening there, with those notes being included in the curriculum, is that if, if you have a Schofield Reference Bible, if you look at the, the title page, where it lists the editors, you'll see that James Gray is listed as one of the consulting editors. James Gray was one of Schofield's friends, along with Gabe Lyne, and he is the president of Moody Bible Institute. So, and when he's the president of the Moody Bible Institute, he takes Schofield's, um, Schofield's notes and includes them within the curriculum of Moody Bible Institute. And oh, by the way, one last thing that I'll mention about Mr. James Gray, we'll study it probably later on, is that Mr. Gray, in his commentary, says that the Great Commission is not for the church. So, he is a very dispensationally minded individual. 
Um, he wasn't right about everything, but these guys are committed to this approach to Scripture. <coughs> so, as if all, last point now on page 5. As if all this were not enough, Schofield directed the Southwestern School of the Bible in Dallas and was president of the Board of Trustees of the denomination Lake Charles College in Lake Charles, Louisiana. In 1918, he founded the Central American Mission, having been inspired by J. Hudson Taylor the previous year at the Niagara Bible Conference. This is the same year he started the correspondence. Page 6, in 1895, Schofield was invited to become pastor of Moody's Home Church, the Trinitarian Congregational Church in Northfield, Massachusetts. When Moody died four years later, Schofield presided over the funeral. When D.L. Moody dies, the officiating pastor at Moody's funeral is C.I. Schofield. Okay? In the, in the Schofield Bible, Mangum and Sweetum discuss some of the more unsavory aspects of Schofield's life under the following headings. Should Schofield's divorce have disqualified him from the ministry he undertook? Second, <coughs> was, was Schofield simply a fraud? Time and space will simply not permit a detailed discussion of this lengthy section of their book. Interested parties are encouraged to seek out their own copy of the book. We will, however, consider a few summary points about these matters. All right? It's too much in here for me to go into every gory detail, so I'm just going to try to summarize for you, give you the gist of a couple things you need to be aware of. Especially within the fundamentalist wing of American Christianity, both this divorce and his struggle with alcoholism held potential for ruining Schofield's reputation and his entire ministry if they had been widely known. Okay? So, the friends of Schofield that don't report these things, do not do it for a reason. And the reason they're not reporting it is because they are afraid that if they do, the fact that he was divorced and the fact that he struggled with alcoholism would immediately disqualify him in the minds of a lot of these people, and that they would no longer give him any type of hearing. So they just don't discuss it. Okay? There were occasions, even during his lifetime, when rumors of Schofield's past life would surface and cause him grief. After one Bible conference, having heard Schofield share his testimony about Christ delivering him from alcoholism, D.L. Moody counseled, uh, counseled him strongly against sharing such aspects of his past life with the public. There is simply no question that Schofield has certain of his close friends there is simply no question that Schofield and certain of his close friends did conceal from the record the fact that Schofield had been divorced and had an ex-wife and children from a previous marriage. <coughs> they did not want the public by at large to know about it because they feared the repercussions. Now you got to understand, whether it's right or wrong, are these fundamentalists extremely conservative? So the fact that he'd been divorced and struggled with alcohol would have been a deal killer for a lot of them if they'd known about it. So the, there appears to be that Schofield is given direct counsel not to discuss it, not to mention it, and not to bring it up. Not only by Moody, but by others possibly as well. Canfield contends that the character flaws in Schofield's failed marriage are part of a pattern of dishonesty both before and after his alleged conversion. So Canfield even calls his conversion alleged. He doesn't even necessarily believe that he ever trusted Christ. According to Canfield, Schofield is guilty of perpetrating instances of fraud and deception throughout his life. Three episodes from Schofield's life are submitted by Canfield as, as proof that Schofield was a fraud. It's important to note that only one of these events happened after Schofield's 1879 conversion. So, according to Canfield, these areas are, number one, as I already said to you, his alleged discrepancies and deceit concerning Schofield's military service in the Confederate Army. Alright? The fact that Schofield lied about his age and his enlistment papers is beyond dispute. No, you can't, it's, it's a record, it's a historical record, you cannot dispute the fact that he lied about his age. <coughs> when he went to enlist in the Confederate Army. Second, Schofield's time as a lawyer and politician. 
Kansas politics seems to have been a hotbed of graft and corruption. And Schofield seems to have been tainted by it uh, to some extent. The exact nature of the political scandal that Schofield found himself in, no one knows for sure. That Schofield engaged in activities of questionable ethics once the scandal broke out seems clear. Being removed from office put him in a desperate situation, not least of all financially. At one point, he used the name of his client, John Ingalls, to secure funds for himself. While Ingalls, while Ingalls never pressed charges, this maneuver cost Schofield his job and ended his legal career in the state of Kansas, the one state which he was fully licensed to practice law. And the final episode that Canfield uses to convict Schofield of being a fraud centers on his credentials. Sometime in the early 1890s, Schofield began using the title Reverend C.I. Schofield, D.D., or Doctor of Divinity. The D.D. refers to an honorary doctor, uh, degree of Doctor of Divinity. What is mysterious about this fact is that no one, including Mangum and Sweetum, have been able to locate any record of what academic institution awarded this honorary degree to Schofield. Canfield jumps to the most slanderous conclusion possible by arguing that Schofield simply conferred it upon himself. <coughs> so, we don't know what institution conferred upon Schofield the doc an honorary doctor of divinity. Canfield uses the lack of information about that as a means, though, to say, to, to jump to the most slanderous possible conclusion that Schofield just gave it to himself. Now, I will say this. We just read about two or three institutions of higher learning that Schofield was either on the board of or a part of. So it's highly possible that any one of those institutions could have conferred upon him an honorary doctorate degree, uh, what is a bit puzzling, though, is why those schools don't have any record of having done so. Um, so these are sort of the facts, and we'll get the last point, and then we have time for a few questions. <coughs> it is certainly beyond question that his own accounts of his life did not contain the whole truth. Some will find this understandable, others devious. Schofield was a sinner, as he claimed. What is probably more remarkable is that he was redeemed relatively late in life, at age 36, and went on to give such notable Christian service till the end of his life. Someone once said, God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. Okay? How straight was the line drawn through the life of Schofield, and how crooked the stick of Schofield the man are points that remain in dispute but that the life and work of Schofield manifest the truth of this proverb, no one can really dispute. Okay? So, any questions, comments, reactions, thoughts about this? Frank? This reminds me a little bit of Pastor Paul. Paul. Right, sorry. <laughs> I think it reminds me a little bit about the, of the Apostle Paul. You know, he, he was kind of a scumbag before he was saved, too. Yeah, pretty much. Mike and then uh, oh, Daryl. I'm just amazed that he was saved in 1879 and 1880. A year later, he's being ordained by the Congregationalists. He must have been an extremely capable, influential, well-known person or something. Well, he, he apparently was able to use his lawyer skills and apply them to ministry in such a way that gained him. Oh, in a year, year's time. Well, I think that the, the key point there is this. this. There's two skills that I think a lawyer would, would benefit from. Number one, the study skills and the ability to process and organize the information. And number two, if he has experience arguing cases in open court, he's probably going to be a fairly good public speaker and be able to present clear sermons to an audience and they'll understand. So I think those are probably two of the things that led him to advance quite rapidly. Daryl? Maybe I had stepped out of the room for a minute, but 
It says in that last note on five, it says in 1980 he found it. So that's, that's not correct, right? 1980. Order? Five, eight, five. Last no, it's a, this print should be okay. 1880. Yeah. Eight. <laughs> it should be 1880. Yeah, it's 1880. <laughs> Can you blame Schofield for any of the stuff he did in his past? Because I don't think I could blame him at all. I mean, everyone has their dirt, but he changed his whole entire life. I, I mean, I think, here's what I'll answer that. I think we got to be honest about who Schofield was. Just like I think we should be honest about who we are. I mean, we all have stuff that we don't want people in this room to know about us, I would imagine. Um, you know, things that we've done and, you know, things that we'd be embarrassed if everybody knew. Um, so I think we got to, I, I think there's two things I would say to that. Number one, I think it's wrong to portray him as being a saint. Like he never did anything. But I also think it's wrong to jump to the other conclusion where you disqualify everything he ever did uh, because he did some things that he shouldn't have. So, you know, I think Fred's analogy of the Apostle Paul is quite fitting for, you know, who Schofield was. Here's a guy that was clearly troubled, was clearly involved in many things that he should not have been in, illegal activities and so on and so forth. He gets saved and it totally changes the course of the rest of his life. Um, so I, I don't really, I don't tend to say, well, I'm going to get rid of my school field reference Bible and I'm going to get rid of everything that he ever wrote. And, and uh, you know, the guy was, I'm just not, I'm not going to do that because I think that's not in line with grace either, really, to be honest. Ronnie? I think the error was made by the biographer. I agree. Because Luke included the dirt about Paul. Yeah, if there's any fault, it may even be that he was counseled to just not say anything. Yeah. Because I, I think that the, the force of his testimony could have been increased if, they, if he had just told people the whole story. Um, so, yeah, you, you may be right that the real, the real issue is not with Schofield himself, but with the people that wrote about him. I'm just a firm believer in it's not your so, past that defines you, it's what you do on a day that defines you, so... Any other questions or comments? Well, yeah. The, the last real issue would have been, and, and the last thing at fault when he claimed he had this doctorate degree, okay, if it was self-made up. If yes, if that, but that can't be proven one way or the other. It cannot be proven beyond doubt that he made it up, and it cannot be proven, and we can't prove who conferred it upon him. But he was certainly friends with and involved with enough. People that were involved with institutions of higher learning within uh, premillennial fundamentalism that could have bestowed upon him that degree. I mean, it's not like he was running in a with a circle of friends, as it were, that had that were not involved with that stuff. So any one of them could have well, could have done it. That would have been my son. Any president of a college, he could set right down. Right. And he wants to sell, say, I'll give you a doctorate's degree, so I'll help you out in here. Because if you look at the title page of the reference Bible, his name is listed as Reverend C.I. Schofield, D.D. I personally feel that if he did confer it upon himself, that's like the stupidest thing you can do, because everybody eventually somebody's going to find out that you're masquerading as a doctor of divinity when you don't have... I just, I just have a hard time believing that he would do that. Um... Maybe he did, I don't know, but I think it's not reasonable that he would have. Okay, Mike? I think it's unfair to, to uh, make a big deal about his, his lying about going into the army. The Civil War was like no other war <coughs> you ever had. You could buy yourself out of conscription if you had the money back then. No one cared if you lied about your age, they just took you. And I think they're taking it out of context a little bit. And Mangum and Sweden make that point. Oh. They make the point that to 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 chastise that in Canfield chastising him about that, he probably would have had to chastise scores of other people right. that did things, you know, ministry related things, um, for this for similar reasons. And so they, 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 they point that out. That's why I personally feel that if you're gonna read a book about Schofield, you should just get this one. Because I think it's 
the, the most fair book. I'll just put it that way. It's nice to know that we Michiganders are aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Only the ones from the UP. <laughs> All right, well, we need to quit. So next week and moving forward, we're going to actually start discussing the reference Bible itself.